Well, good morning, church family. As we begin this morning, I just want to start off by saying happy Mother's Day to all the moms. We're grateful for you, and we're grateful for the job that you do, and we hope that your day is special and that you have just a a wonderful time together with your family as best as you can. Uh, This morning, we're going to be looking at a variety of scriptures, and I'll I'll tell you which scriptures we're going to be looking at in in just a moment. Um, But let me ask this question as we start off today. Have you ever come to a breaking point in your life where you realized it was time to make some changes, but you weren't completely certain what changes you needed to make? You could tell you needed to do something, but you weren't 100% certain what needed to change. I've gone through several seasons of my life very much like that, and uh, even while we're in the midst of this season that we're in right now, I'm trying to view it through that kind of lens. I'm trying to figure out, all right, what kind of changes need to be made? Now, those of you that know me well know that one of the things that I like to do is I, I like to create routines, and so I thrive on setting certain objectives for myself and then creating routines that help me meet those objectives. Some of the goals that I set are short-term uh, some of the goals that I like to set for myself are long-term goals, and then I strive to, to reach the short-term and strive to reach the long-term goals. It's kind of like this mental game that I play with myself, but I, I, I enjoy it, and uh, I feel like it typically produces healthy results. But right now, I'm in the midst of a season like we all are when my routines and my objectives have been forcibly interrupted. And I think we all understand that. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to utilize this time in constructive ways because I don't feel like I really have much of a choice anyway. And, uh, well, I guess I could use it destructively, but I'm trying to use it constructively. And I'm trying to make several healthy changes. And if I'm honest, I'd have to say I think that that's something that the Lord wants each of us to do, and I think that that would be something He would be uh, pleased to see us utilize this time to make some of those healthy changes. So what are some of the healthy changes that we should be making? What are some of these changes that we could be adjusting or making? What priorities outlined in Scripture should we start valuing that maybe up to this point we haven't fully given our attention to, or maybe we haven't valued these things to the degree that the Lord encourages us to value them. Well, this morning, like I said just a moment ago, we're going to be looking at four related portions of Scripture. We're going to be in Romans chapter 13, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 22, we're going to be in Psalm 90, and then very briefly we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. So we're going to be looking at these four Uh, sections of Scripture today. But before we do, as we're thinking about this idea of of using this moment to make healthy changes, before we do, I just want to have a word of prayer for us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity for us to spend some time together this morning looking at your Word and thinking about the type of things that you reveal to us in it. Lord, we're grateful for the type of uh, just the healthy changes that, that you enable us to make as your spirit empowers us. And Lord, we pray that during this particular season where our routines and our objectives and our goals and all of those things are experiencing some level of disruption, we pray, Lord, that we would recognize that you're sovereign over all things. And even in the midst of this circumstance right now, you're in complete control. So, Lord, I know I need to be reminded of that from time to time, and I think we all probably do. And so, since you're in complete control, and since you ordain all things to work together for the good of those that love you, we pray, Father, that you would help us as we go through this season to be able to utilize this time to make healthy changes in our lives as your Spirit empowers us to do so. And we thank you for the counsel that you give to us from your Word that shows us what that looks like and how that's done. So we pray now as we look at several portions of your word today, that you'd give us your wisdom and your insight, and that you would create a desire within us to actually live these things out. We commit this time to you now, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The first portion of Scripture that I want to start us off with today is found in Romans chapter 13. And in Romans chapter 13, I just want to read verse 8 for starters. And we'll come back to this chapter several times this morning. 
But the first healthy change that I think the Scripture advises us to make as we look at this Scripture is that we should owe nothing but love. Think about that statement for a second. Owe nothing but love. Let me read Romans 13, verse 8. It says this, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, I'm grateful for the emphasis that we see in Scripture related to the concept of love. By nature, when you look at how Scripture describes God, we see that God is, by nature, the perfection of love. And He's shown us His love in countless ways. But there's no greater example of the love of God that we could point to than the love God has shown us in giving His Son, Jesus Christ, to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And since we're the beneficiaries of the deepest kind of love that could possibly be demonstrated, we're called to be lavish in sharing that love with others. And I just read from Romans chapter 13, verse 8, and I love that portion of Scripture. And in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, Paul speaks of the concept of debt. And he does so when he makes this statement, when he says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. Owe no one anything except to love each other. So it's clear here that his emphasis is on showing love generously, but I appreciate the way he demonstrates this concept in this particular passage, or the way he, he explains this concept. He appeals to the, to the familiar life experience that I think most, if not all of us, have had of this feeling of owing a debt. And that's what he brings up here in Romans 13, 8. Now, uh, several months ago, before our, our national shutdown began, I mentioned to my family and, and actually to several members of our church that I thought we were probably close to some sort of pronounced downturn in our economy. Um, there were a few things that were, were making me think that. I remember one particular day uh, having that conversation uh, with a member of the church just in the entryway of the building here, just the fact that I, I really thought we were about due for a pretty pronounced downturn. Now, I had no idea what was going to cause it. It seemed like we were ripe for it, though. And um, in the midst of that, I started thinking about what I know about the Great Depression and that era in American history. And, uh, and so I started reading some things online about the Great Depression. I actually started watching several documentaries on the Great Depression because I wanted to see if there was a pattern that I could notice in that season of time that would be relevant for this season of time, just so I could be mindful of it and uh, be watchful for it. And I know that it sounds super exciting to think about spending multiple evenings sitting down watching documentaries on the Great Depression. I really wish during that era I had invited you over to my home and, uh, and so that you could join me and we could watch those things together. Um, I'm sure you would have found it riveting. But I actually did find a pattern. It's a very obvious pattern that you see when you start watching those documentaries or when you start reading up on that particular season of time. But during that particular time, many businesses failed and many families experienced terrible financial pain. But those who experienced the most pain, and this was the pattern that I noticed, those who experienced the most pain were typically those who were overburdened with debt. If you were overburdened with debt during the era of the Great Depression, um, it, it, the Great Depression hit you uh, much harder than if you weren't. And, you know, basically the debt that was so easy to get into during the good times ended up hurting businesses and ended up hurting families during the lean times. Now, those of you that know me well realize that I'm not a fan of debt, and I'll even say this, and I know that this is unsolicited advice, but I actually hope you'll hear me on this. Because I want the best for our church family, or anyone who's, who's watching or listening to this recording, I would like to personally encourage you to avoid debt as best as you can. But let me even say this. Let's say you get on the other side of all your financial debts. Let's say your house is paid off, your cars are paid off, student loans, credit cards, personal loans, all that. You get it all paid off. So you have everything paid off and you could look at your finances and say, okay, I know or I owe no one anything. I don't owe a single person a penny. That would certainly be a good thing. But even after our financial debts are satisfied, 
When you look at what Paul says here in this passage, it tells, he tells us here that there is one obligation or one debt, we could say, that will never go away. It never goes away. God's Word tells us that we are obligated, or we could say we are indebted to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are indebted to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's, it's Christ's calling on my life. It's Christ's calling on your life. We are called not to hold back love. We are called not to fail to offer it. And basically, our mindset is this, or should be this, that as recipients of Christ's generous love toward us, we're instructed to be lavish in the genuine love that we share with others. And Scripture reveals to us, and we'll see this here in the next portion of Scripture I'm about to take us to, but Scripture reveals to us that in so doing, we will fulfill the essence of what the Ten Commandments were teaching us to do toward our family and toward our friends and toward our neighbors. In fact, when you look at the verses that come right after Romans 13, 8, so when you look at verse 9 and when you look at verse 10 of Romans chapter 13, what Paul starts to tell us to do, this healthy change that the Holy Spirit can facilitate within us, that we can then live out, is this idea that we could start grasping the heart of God's commands. So it's obvious when you look through Scripture that the Lord's communicated things to us. He's told me and He's told you to actually do things, to actually live things out in a particular way. And as we do so, we want to do so with His mind and His eyes and His heart. And so Paul followed up verse 8, which we just read, by encouraging us in verses 9 and 10 to start to grasp the heart of God's commands. Let me read those two verses for us. They say this, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, if I asked you to recite the Ten Commandments, to get them all in order, to just recite them from memory, could you do that? Could you recite the Ten Commandments from memory? I remember when I was growing up, right around when I was age 10, uh, my, the church that I grew up at, actually made all the 10-year-olds memorize the Ten Commandments. They had a program in the church. It was referred to as junior membership. And so to become a junior member, one of the things that we had to memorize, we had to memorize several things, but one of the things we had to memorize was the Ten Commandments. And we would sit down with one of our Sunday school teachers who would then quiz us and see how well we did on it. And I remember being very nervous before that quiz, but I got them right, and, and I was able to become a junior member of my home church. But I'll say this. I think the Ten Commandments are extremely important for us to know. I think our culture would be in a a, a much better spot if if, uh, we valued them and lived them out. And and certainly, you know, I I think, um, oh, I think it was R.C. Sproul that said it, but it could have been somebody else. But they said, you know, basically we we have volumes and volumes and volumes of laws that get enacted because we struggle to actually just live out the Ten Commandments. If we would live out the Ten Commandments, we wouldn't have to have quite as many laws written into our law books, and they just keep growing and keep growing and keep growing because we find new ways to conveniently skirt the Ten Commandments and conveniently kind of move along to the side or ignore them. But when you look at the Ten Commandments, if you kind of step back and just look at them in segments, you could actually see that the Ten Commandments are really broken up into two groups the first four commandments, and then the next six. And the first four commandments show us things about how we're to relate to God. So when you look at the first four commandments, we're told we're to have no other gods before him. We're told not to worship any graven image. We're told not to take God's name in vain. And we're told to honor the Sabbath, to remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy. So these are four commandments related to our relationship with God. But then when you look at the next six commandments, those six commandments demonstrate what it looks like for us to relate to one another. And in that portion of Scripture, 
It tells us to honor your father and your mother. It's a good commandment to remember today on Mother's Day, right? Honor your father and your mother. Then it tells us you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, and you shall not covet. So again, the first four commandments deal with our vertical relationship to God. The next six commandments deal with our horizontal relationship with one another. But even if you can't remember all Ten Commandments right off the top of your head, even if they don't immediately all come to mind, I'm sure you can remember a very simple summary of them. And the Ten Commandments can be summarized in a very simple statement. Love God and love one another. So even when we're thinking about healthy changes that we can make in our day-to-day life, well, we could frame it in, in that particular way and just kind of put that banner over all of it. All, all of the changes that we're making. Is this something that helps me love God? And is this something that helps me to love the people that God's brought into my life? Love God and love one another. If you remember that, you remember the essence of the Ten Commandments, the first four and the next six. If we love others with the love that we've been shown through Jesus Christ, we won't disrespect them, we won't hurt them, We won't steal from them. We won't kill them. We love our spouses, our children, our neighbors, our co-workers, even those that may act like they're our enemies. If we love them with the love of Christ, we're effectively fulfilling God's teaching on the law regarding human relationships. We're loving one another. We're showing respect, even toward those who don't respect us. The other day, maybe some of you saw this because I posted it online, But the other day, I read the comments of somebody who is actually rooting for the current shutdown to hurt local churches so deeply that many of them will be forced to close. I I was, I guess, not terribly shocked when I read that statement online, but a little bit, no, not just a little bit, I was a lot disturbed by seeing that. I, I thought that was very disappointing, very sad to see somebody actually openly, online, rooting for local churches to suffer so much in the midst of this current pandemic that that many will be forced to close. And that's what this person was rooting to see happen. And uh, he stated that that's what he hopes will be the long-term effect of these stay-at-home orders. And again, that was a sad thing to read. And I looked at that and I thought, all right, well, how should I respond to that? So what do you think? How should I respond to somebody saying something like that? You know, how should I respond as a Christian? Or how should I respond as a pastor to somebody who's actually verbally and publicly rooting for local churches to close as a result of stay-at-home orders? Well, the way I should respond, the way you should respond, the way any of us who are Christians should respond is shown to us in Matthew chapter 22. Jesus shows us how to respond to all kinds of circumstances like this. Let me read for us from Matthew 22, starting with verse 36, and I'll read down to verse 40. But in that passage, it says this, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, so this is Jesus now replying, and Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, And with all your mind, this is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So what's Christ encouraging us to understand when we look at his summary there? He wants us to grasp the heart of God's commands wants us to grasp it, because if we grasp the heart of of God's commands, we'll think about our vertical relationship with the Lord. We'll think about, okay, is this action I'm about to take, or this way I'm about to invest my time, is this an expression of my love for the Lord, or is it the opposite? Is this an expression of my love for other people, or is it the opposite? The way I think, the way I speak, does it reflect the love of God, or does it reflect my old fleshly nature? And Christ was encouraging us when we look at Matthew chapter 22. He was encouraging us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and to love our neighbors as ourselves, even 
even if that neighbor, even if that person doesn't share the love that you share with them, even if they don't reciprocate it, Christ gives us the answer of how we're to respond. I think about this a lot right now because I see a lot of things that, uh, that I applaud, and I see a lot of things I'm very uncomfortable with, and I think, all right, I need to be very thoughtful and mindful of these scriptures and how I choose to respond to things. And I think it would be wise for us as believers to have that in mind during this particular season as we wrestle with what are some healthy changes we could be making. Another healthy change that I think is brought up in Scripture, and again, I'm going to take us back to Romans 13. We'll see this in verse 11 of Romans 13. The way I'll interpret it is this way. I'll say it like this. Do more with your life than just stare at a screen. Do more with your life than just stare at a screen, which seems comical to say right now as we're live streaming our worship services. And if you're watching this, you're watching it on a screen. So I guess we have to have some exceptions, right? But we're saying, do more with your life than just stare at a screen. Look at what it says in Romans 13, 11. It says, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. I'm going to ask a weird question, but it's not that weird. Uh, It's just the type of question that we don't ask enough, in my opinion. But the question is this, what would you do if you knew for certain you only had a short time left to live? You knew for certain you only had a short time left to live. What would you do? Are there any changes that you might make in how, you, in how you spend your time and how you're choosing to utilize the time that you've been giving, given, any changes that you might make. Would you spend the remainder of your time staring at a, at a phone or staring at a TV? Or would you try to do something more constructive? I got an advertisement from Verizon uh, just earlier today saying, hey, we've created new ways to keep you entertained as you stare at your screens. Utilize this and utilize this and utilize this. And I thought... I might need to send Verizon my sermon today. (laughs) But we got to do more than just spend our lives staring at a screen. So what again, what if what if you knew for a fact that you only had a short amount of time left? Now, how about this? What if I told you that that's absolutely true? That you really that you really do only have a short amount of time left left. Would that sound cryptic? Would that sound weird or dark? Um, Here's the thing. I'm not being theoretical and I'm not being hypothetical. That's actually the case for me and for you. We only have a short amount of time left. I love when you look at at, at the type of things that the Apostle Paul expresses when he is trying to challenge churches during the era in which he was doing his ministry. But when Paul was conducting his apostolic ministry, I get the impression that he was doing so with a sense of urgency. And when reading the scriptures that he penned, when looking at these things that he wrote down, or even reading some of the things that were written about him, when you read through the book of Acts and see the things that Luke wrote down about the Apostle Paul, I'm given the impression that the Apostle Paul wanted to make the best use of the time that he had been given. And again, you can see here in Romans chapter 13, verse 11, he wanted us to make great use of the time we've been given as well. That's something that we're called to do likewise, right? And in this verse, you have Paul addressing a problem that was apparently present among some of the believers in the church at Rome. Some of them had become, I think, spiritually lazy. Some of them had become rather spiritually complacent. Um, And by the way, spiritual complacency is a genuine tragedy, particularly for believers who ought to know better. You know, because we don't have much time. So why do we waste so much of it? Now is the time, when you look at what it tells us here in Romans 13, 11, now is the time for us to wake from our slumber. Because the full effects of our salvation are going to be experienced sooner than we realize. And what I mean by that is this. In Christ, we've been justified. At present, the Holy Spirit is sanctifying us. And next up, God the Father is going to glorify us, and we're finally going to experience the eternal outcome 
of everything that He's been bringing together for us. And that's what Paul was getting at here when he said, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. He's saying, listen, the time is short. The full effects of your salvation, when you actually come to that day where the Father glorifies you in His presence, He's saying that day is coming soon. So don't waste time. Don't spend all your time sleeping. Wake from sleep. So in our context, it might not be that we're spending all our time sleeping, but maybe we're wasting our time just kind of feeding our mind mindless and unhealthy and unwise things. And maybe we're wasting our time just staring at screens and and engaged in apps that really just cause us to waste day after day after day. I don't know if any of you get a screen report on uh, your screen time, how much you use it during the course of the week. But I have to tell you, sometimes I get that report and I look at it and I think, that's way too much. I spent way too much on my phone this week. And I look at that and I think, all right, every time I'm doing that, or most of the time I'm doing that, I feel like I'm wasting my life. And I don't think that that's God's calling for me, and it's certainly not God's calling for you either. What I do love is what we're told in Psalm 90, verse 12. Let me read that for us. Psalm 90, verse 12, it says this, and it's said like a prayer, but it says, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. I'm going to read that again. It says, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. The Lord's telling us that, you know, if you want to ultimately experience the wisdom to the level that he wants us to experience it, one of the things that we need to understand is that there's a number to our days and they've been given to us as a gift, but we really shouldn't waste them. It is unwise to waste the days that we've been given. We fail to grow in the wisdom that the Lord wants us to grow in when we spend all our time just wasting it. So if you've been wrestling with some spiritual complacency, like apparently some in the Roman church had been experiencing, you know, if you've been complacent about your walk with Christ, you've been complacent about living out your faith, that's one of those areas that you're looking at and you're saying, all right, complacency is unhealthy. It's definitely present in my life. This is a healthy change I need to start making. You've been complacent about those things. I'm I'm saying it's time to turn off the TV. It's time to fulfill your mission and stop staring at your phone every single day for hours and hours and hours and hours. Don't waste the time you've been given. It has a limit. It comes to an end as far as your earthly life is concerned. So use the time, the brief time you've been given to make investments in your walk with Christ And then as your faith is overflowing, as you've been making investments in your relationship with Christ, then make investments from that overflow into the lives of others so that they would grow in their walk with Christ. Now, not everybody that you try to make investments in is going to receive those investments like you want them to. You know, many of you are parents and you probably try and make investments in your children. And sometimes they look at you like you're trying to uh, punish them, you know, as you're trying to do something that you know is for their benefit. You know, that's something that that you may not always experience immediately, the fruit of the investments you're trying to make in people, but I do believe in time. You know, so as you're trying to invest in your friends or in your children or in other people in your life, I do believe in time the Lord makes use of those investments. So invest in your walk with Him, and then invest from that overflow. As your life starts overflowing with the goodness of God, invest from that overflow into the lives of those that you love, but don't just sit around and stare. Even during this time when we're all feeling cooped up, don't just sit around and stare. Do something constructive. Make an investment in your walk with Christ that then can be utilized to make an investment in the lives of others to help them in their walk with Christ. One other thing that I want to point out to us this morning, and this is where we'll finish up today, but it's an important thing for us to notice And it's it's one of those umbrella-type statements that is very useful for us to apply in our day-to-day living, and that's this. We need to live in the light of Christ. We need to live in the light of Christ. Now, think about this. Even right now, while many of us feel cooped up and locked up inside our homes, what does it look like to live in the light of Christ in the current context you're in? What does it look like to live in the light of Christ in other contexts? Well, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 13. If you look at verse 12, 13, and 14, he says this, The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So, let us, so then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime 
not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So again, the final priority that Paul emphasizes in this particular chapter is this idea of prioritizing living in the light of Christ instead of living in the the darkness of sin, instead of living in the darkness of temptation. And again, keep in mind, he's expressing these things to fellow believers in Christ. He's teaching these things to a group of people who claim to already follow Christ. So just let that sink in for a second. Paul's making it clear that those who have been blessed with new life in Christ can still be easily led astray. So that's us. You know, if we've been blessed with new life in Christ, keep in mind, we could still easily be led astray. We could be lured into the temptations of darkness if we're not intentional about wearing the armor of the light of Christ as a protective shield around us. And look at some of the examples Paul gives us here of the works of darkness. He speaks of sexual sin, He speaks of drunkenness, he speaks of quarreling, and then he goes on to speak about jealousy. So he he addresses each of these things, and by the way, news reports, as as I'm reading them or watching them, news reports are telling us that culturally, right now, there's been a big spike on each of those four categories as people are dealing with the effects of feeling anxious or feeling locked up, and so sexual sin, drunkenness, quarreling, jealousy... Those things seem to be culturally on the rise right now as people react to feeling locked up or react to their feelings of anxiety. In fact, the scripture that we looked at last Sunday from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it also spoke of Christians dealing with these particular areas of struggle. So again, I want to emphasize, yeah, it may be culturally that people are dealing with these things, but we as Christians deal with these things as well. It was mentioned in 2 Corinthians 12 that we looked at last week. It's mentioned here in Romans chapter 13 as well. So do any of us feel like we're above being tempted in any of these categories? Are you above being, above being tempted by sexual sin? Are you above being tempted by drunkenness? Are you above being tempted to quarrel or to feel jealous in an unhealthy way? I think all of us are easily tempted in each of these areas. But again, while speaking of these things, Paul also admonishes us to put on or to clothe ourselves with the presence of Christ. And he says, the reason you do this, the purpose for doing this, is so you won't make plans or provisions that are aimed at rebelling against Jesus by indulging in, in, one of, in any one of these unhealthy areas. So you clothe yourself with Christ. You put on the armor of the light of Christ so that you won't make provisions and plans to end up walking into those areas of temptation or those areas of struggle. And by the way, all of us have struggles. Not a single one of us makes it through mistake-free. So we all make mistakes. We all struggle with all sorts of things. So again, as we look at this passage and the the subsequent passages that we've been looking at alongside of it, um, don't make the the additional mistake of assuming that the Lord is not aware of our struggles, because the Lord is aware of the things that we're struggling with. And he recognizes that in a fallen world, it can be very difficult for us to consistently walk in the light of Christ. But again, don't forget that he's not asking us to do that on our own. He's not asking us to do that without his help. He hasn't asked us to clothe ourselves in our own armor. Christ offers us his armor. And I'm confident that the protective power of Christ within us and around us is sufficient for every single thing we need. So let me say this as we wrap up. What have been, what have been your priorities in life up to this point? You know, if you had to categorize them or summarize them, what have been your priorities in life up to this point? And are these the priorities that you still feel Christ is calling you to emphasize? Or might it be time to restructure them? Might it be time to start making some healthy changes? You know, can this moment when your routine is being forcefully interrupted 
actually turn into a season of very healthy change for you spiritually? Is the love of Christ lavishly flowing from your life? Do you understand the heart of God behind what he's commanded you? Are you embracing your divinely ordained mission so that you won't waste time? Are you living in the light of Christ? These are the type of things that I think come up from the scriptures that we've just looked at together. And the Lord wants us to use this time to make healthy changes that he empowers us to make. So let me conclude by sharing one last scripture with us. And it's a scripture that helps us to understand and focus on what matters most. And it's from Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And this is where we'll end today. But it says this, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to look at your word together today. We're grateful for the privilege that it is to be able to read these things, to be able to study these things, to be able to utilize your power and your protective presence to make healthy changes in our lives. Lord, we know that we struggle with the same things that the people in Rome struggled with. We noticed that we struggle with the same things that those in Corinth wrestled with. We struggle with the same things that those in our own culture are wrestling with. Our issues are common to us all. We're all wrestling with the same things. But Lord, you're also giving us an opportunity right now, in many respects, to pause. We could use this time constructively, or we can completely waste this time. But Lord, if we're, if we're using this time constructively, I believe that one of the things that you want us to do is to rely on your power and utilize the counsel of your word so that we could start making some healthy changes, so that we could start noticing some areas of our lives that we would say, you know what, that's been deficient or that's been off track. That's an area that doesn't demonstrate a genuine love for the Lord. That doesn't demonstrate a genuine love for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, point those things out to us, we pray, and by your grace, we pray that we would utilize your power to make healthy changes, that we would make no provision for the flesh, but that we would walk in the light of Christ as you empower us by your Spirit to do so. Thank you so much, Lord, for the the privilege to be able to look at these things together today. Thank you for the reminders that you give to us from your word. And thank you for your presence with us right now. We commit this day and we commit this week to your care. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks again for being with us this morning. Thank you as well to those of you who who join us from all over the place. I get to hear from uh, some of you that are really uh, accessing these these messages from places that I have never been. And some of you are accessing these messages from places that I've been to many times, just not recently. So we welcome you. We're grateful that in a, in a real sense that we have the, the privilege on Sunday mornings to gather together and to worship the Lord together, even though we do so digitally right now. And I just want to say one last thing, one last thank you to all the moms out there. Thank you for the sacrifices that you make to make investments in your children. All of us are the beneficiaries of the nurturing care and the blessing that our mothers have been in our lives. So sometimes when we're little and when we're young, we don't think to thank our moms. And sometimes when we're older, we wish that we thanked our moms a little bit more. So let's just publicly and actively thank our mothers today for just the ways in which they have been such a blessing and and how they've invested in our lives with the gifts and the talents and the time that God gave them. So moms, we appreciate you. Thank you so much for everything that you do. And to everybody else, we hope you have a wonderful week and we look forward to getting together again uh, very soon. And I can't wait till I see your faces too. Take care.